Thank you very much, Liz. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I would like to spend a couple of moments talking with you about Power BI and how to load your data into your data model so that you will make the best of Power BI's extensive capabilities. I am Rachel Martino. I'm a principal consultant here at Pragmatic Works. Been with the company a little over a year now, and I'm actually based in the Boston area. So for those of you who know Pragmatic Works as a Florida firm, we actually are much more than that. And we're all over the country. I have a picture here of myself on vacation last summer in Japan. I've been working with SQL Server and Oracle databases for a long time, held a number of positions in IT from application development through program director, and I am focused on helping our customers build a culture of excellence around using their data assets. What I wanted to talk to you about today was how to know if you're having performance issues with Power BI, why you maybe haven't really experienced this yet, and are, uh, this might be in your future, so how to identify it when you see it, I guess is what I'm, I'm looking for. And I've got a number of tips and techniques that I think will help you when you do find that you're reaching the point of having some issues with Power BI. And I'd like to do a demonstration of how to take advantage of some of those techniques and use them to streamline your data. But let's start with probably the most common experience in Power BI, which is you pointed at your data source, uh, you're probably importing data, maybe you're using direct query, and it's operating pretty fast. And that is the, the initial experience that you get with Power BI, and very often that is the extent of data modeling that people will execute in this environment as they're preparing to use Power BI for their own use or maybe some departmental use. But as you move forward and you start to share your tools with other people, and as you start to load more and more data into them, you may find that some of these issues arise. And it becomes important to understand what about the data that you're loading might be causing problems and whether there might be something pretty straightforward you can do about it to help resolve the issues. I did hear in the opening uh, questions that about half of you are beginners with Power BI and uh, about a third of you consider yourself intermediate Power BI users. And I'll spend just a minute talking about what is Power BI and where does it fit. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure you have some familiarity with the tool. And uh, that is probably what brought you here today. In this graphic that we have here, we can see Power BI has a number of aspects to it represented by some different graphics here on the screen. The upper right shows us that there are over 50 plus apps that you can pull data directly into in Power BI. And in parallel with that, we see Power BI Desktop. Um, the reason they're shown in parallel, even though you can pull that data into Power BI Desktop, is because there's a separate set of tools that is in the cloud called the Power BI service, and that is where we deploy our Power BI solutions most often to share them with our colleagues. And from there, if we have data that's on premises, we'll go back through Power BI gateways to access it. So I just wanted to call your attention to the fact that Power BI Desktop is frequently where we develop our Power BI solutions. The service is often where we deploy them for sharing, although more and more there are capabilities for editing the reports out there and actually building out a pretty robust environment for editing and creating reports as well as uh, collaborating work groups. And the Power BI Gateways points you back to on-prem data. Access to Power BI is represented on this 
image with a number of interfaces. And as you know, once you've got that out there in the service, it's available to anyone who has rights to the Azure uh, environment, the uh, office environment that Power BI is published in. Anyone who has rights to your specific solution, I should say, not just the entire environment. As a tool internally, Power BI leverages Power Pivot and Power View capabilities. And using Power Query, you build out a data model within your solution. And that data model is loaded into an in-memory columnar, excuse me, columnar database. And this is a very fast way of storing and accessing your data, preparing it for use in reporting. The truth is that as people are using our solutions, although at first they may be pretty well wowed with the visualization capabilities that you provide them in this tool, very soon you, uh, they start to experience this kind of need for immediate response. There is a perception that a click to response time should not be more than about three seconds. Uh, Ten seconds is really our upper limit. We want to make sure that our user experience respects that, that we're building a solution that is capable of delivering that kind of experience. And Power BI is extremely good at that. I don't want to uh, leave you with the impression that this is a slow tool. I am here to help you make it faster if you are having problems. The uh, capability to access reports and to filter and slice them and to load data up, refresh data in them very quickly is inherent in the tool. Let's spend a minute talking about what I meant by the columnar storage and the in-memory capability of the uh, architecture for Power BI. The X-Velocity name is the name given to the in-memory analytics engine by Microsoft. And just while we're on this slide, I'll point out that a number of these slides have URLs on them. Some of them have URLs or links without exposing the URL, only for space. And I will be uh, updating my uh, already existing blog posts with the latest deck of slides, which has just a few updates that I made while preparing for today's talk. But the links will be available to you when you uh, access the slides through the blog. Back to what we were talking about. We were talking about the architecture. So the X Velocity engine is sort of described on this slide, and it's a little difficult to capture, but what I wanted to point out is that the table that is diagrammed in this first area here, over to the left where it says uh, T1 with three columns, has data in it. And those data may be partitioned, that's item number five, that kind of comes later, but those data are combined with the calculated columns, which are stored just like regular data, and that's going to be important to us in a little bit, as well as with hierarchies that are represented in red and relationships that are represented in purple. And when they are stored, they are compressed and loaded into memory in uh, the server, in the Power BI server, whether it's running from your desktop or running from the Power BI service. There's an excellent description of how that works on the site where I uh, pulled this diagram, which is linked, referenced at the bottom, and also Marco Russo did a nice talk about that, about tabular solutions a couple of years ago, also referenced here. Performance issues in Power BI can show themselves in a few ways. The most prevalent of them will be slow processing of data loads and data loads that just take longer than we want them to or longer than we need them to. Um, you need 
a uh, you need to be cognizant when you're designing your Power BI solution that uh, calculated columns and a number of relationships can affect the speed of query processing. Columns, as I mentioned in the previous slide, are stored just like the data columns and they are completely calculated during processing and stored into the in-memory columnar store. So when you make any changes during data pro during design, I mean, your calculated columns will update. So just be aware of that because you're going to see the implications of that as you start to work more and more with your data model and to add in more customizations. The most impactful issues occur on the visualization side. That is when you find that your users are clicking on something on the screen and waiting and waiting for the screen to update. During that update, data is being accessed from through various relationships uh, all throughout the column or data store just to pull data from your columns and your calculated columns. But also all of your measures are being updated. Measures are different from calculated columns in that they are affected by the slicers and the time frames or perhaps the uh, graphics context of each place where they're used on your page. So if you think about how many calculations need to be made to lay out a graph, uh, you can imagine how many uh, measures are being calculated on each page refresh. So that's where we really want to make sure that we don't run into performance problems. And the tips and techniques I'm going to talk about are going to help us to streamline our data model to make all of those things happen a lot faster. This talk came about because about a year ago I was working on a project and I found that all of a sudden as I was building out my Power BI model, I was waiting and waiting for every change I made. If I changed a relationship in the model, if I added a calculated column, I was waiting like to count to 10. And then a few minutes later, I found I was having to count to 20, trying to figure out, trying to wait for the response back from Power BI. And someone said to me, well, you must be using a lot of data. And I realized I wasn't using that much data. I was using a good amount of data, about 380,000 rows, but Power BI should be able to handle 380,000 rows in a fact table, and it shouldn't really be that kind of a blocker for the tool. But what matters is what's in your rows, right? So I just, without knowing any of the tips or techniques, I took a look at my file size on disk, and between the yellow line at the bottom and the yellow line at the top of this little chart that I have here, you can see how much of a jump, sorry, I haven't practiced these lately, uh, how much of a jump the file size took went from about 46 meg to about 586 meg with the addition of a single table. <clears throat> We're going to talk a lot about that table in a few minutes. But the point here is I started seeing performance implications. And the only thing I really needed to measure that by or to evaluate that by was looking at file size saved on disk. But file size is not really a direct impact on performance because that's the file on disk. Even while I'm using it, I'm not reading the disk, right? Because this is an in-memory data storage environment. So what I needed to understand was what's going on in them. So let's find out what happened. <coughs> I started doing some research, and I found a number of tips for streamlining my data model. And what I'm going to do is run through the tips for you first and a couple of techniques for evaluating the model. And then we're going to do a demonstration of uh, 
how this works. The first thing I learned was that tall, narrow tables are, in general, faster than even shorter but wider tables. And what do I mean by wider? I mean things that have a number of fields, just simply many, many columns. And what can really matter is what's in those columns. So the first thing I recommend as tip number one is just remove any unused fields. If you're not reporting on it, why do you need it in your reporting data model? So go ahead and take out the columns. You can see I've got a Power Pivot Pro tip there. And then be aware of what kind of analysis is going to be executed on your model and remove anything that you don't think is going to be used for any kind of analysis. So that's sort of a, uh, an addition to the remove any unused fields. Think about it again. Maybe there's a version of that column that could be used, but this original column is not helpful. Go ahead and remove that original column and only keep the derived columns. Just take out anything that's not relevant, including especially relationship IDs. Frequently, these are uh, larger GUID strings, uh, not huge strings, but they're strings, and they're highly unique. They're referencing uh, unique records off on another table. And if we're not trying to reference that table, then perhaps we don't need those relationship IDs. There is a caveat here. If you have tens of millions of rows, uh, one million row partitioning is executed in the uh, X velocity engine. So you just want to be aware of that. Uh, it doesn't always. Uh, cause issues and in fact you can uh, maximize your performance within that by using effective sorting before the chunking takes place, before the data is actually loaded. Another sort of insight related to the amount of data in any row is the data type itself. A string data type is stored in a way that is, uses more space than an integer data type. The strings are actually stored in a hash table, so there's a reference to the string, but you still have to store the hash table. So if you have a highly unique long string value uh, column, this is going to be very difficult to compress and it's going to require more storage than perhaps X extracting from that some nugget of information, maybe parsing it in some way, or building a calculated column that, that looks for keywords in maybe a description field or something. The less unique the column is, uh, is especially important for string values where they're more difficult to compress. And one recommendation is that strings used as IDs can use unreasonable amounts of memory. We've already talked about that a little bit. Um, so just be aware of that and perhaps you can modify your IDs, use a surrogate key of some type that is an integer. Uh, and you'll be using a more efficient data storage tool. Tip number three is related to that visualization experience. It's what the, your user's going to experience. And this is that slicers use multiple queries. So for each slicer that you put on a page, you're actually populating that list, or when you click on that list, you're causing queries against it to be executed multiple times. So slicers are very good tool. They're crucial to making a good user experience with your interface. But just be aware of how many of them you're piling up. Because for each one, first they'll have to run a query and populate the list, and then run a second query to figure out which item is being selected in the slicer, especially if they're cross-filtering each other. So if you have bi-directional relationships in your data model, 
and you have a number of tables that are filtering each other. If I pick the year 2012, then I will only get the sales reps who worked for the firm in the year 2012. That relationship causes a number of queries to be executed, and that will uh, take more time to populate your page. Additionally, if you have very high cardinality slicers, or slicers with many, many unique values, it can be very difficult user experience to search through that slicer and find which row someone needs to slice by. So one, one very effective tool that has come out since then uh, is a filterable slicer. It's available in the uh, gallery of Power BI visuals. That's a huge help. Um, this slide was actually written before that existed, and, and I think that makes a big caveat to that bullet point there. But at the same time, you want to think about the user and the fact that they need to know what they're looking for in that case. They can't possibly scroll down the entire list and see every option if you have hundreds and hundreds of rows. And in some cases, we're talking about thousands of rows. You want to be careful about how slicers affect the user experience as well as performance. It's important that you understand your DAX functions and the calculations. How they work, of course but also how they work. The uh, DAX formula engine is uh, single-threaded, so you're going to find that it's not quite as efficient as your um, in-memory column or data store. So you want to be careful about that, and uh, as many calculated columns as you can use will be populated during data load and not recalculating when your user is using your tool. If, however, you find that you're having problems executing a complete data load in, within your window of data load time, then you might think about shifting some of the load of your calculated columns back to your data source. There are a number of these that will cause the entire table to be scanned. Um, so I've called out a few here on this slide, filter, min, max, and you just want to be available, uh, excuse me, you just want to be aware that uh, moving those to your original database, if you're running from a database, if you can create those in the database before you load the data up to Power BI, then you'll take that load off that single threaded formula. Tips five and six are pretty, uh, pretty easy to describe, but they're really good ones. I like these a lot. So for instance, the number of unique values in our column will be very high if we're storing date and time for all of our records. T date and time field actually stores time values out to the thousandth of a second. That's highly, more than likely, that's a highly unique number for you. You probably don't have a lot of records that were all created within one thousandth of a second of each other. How much of that detail do you need? The um, fact is that most of us could probably truncate off at least the seconds in our date time. And in some cases, I found that, found that it made more sense just to keep track of the time of day that something took place, as opposed to the actual hour or minutes. So it really is going to depend, like so much of this, on your data and your reporting needs. And that's what we're really talking about here, is building your data model to support the needs of the reports and the analysis that are going to be executed on. Another way of simplifying that's very straightforward is just to split your date time into date and time. 
now you've gone from having, you know, to the thousandth of a second of uniqueness across all of your values. If you have a date column, instead of having hundreds of thousands of rows possible per year, you will have 365 because you've got a date column. Your time values will be only the number of time elements of the granularity of time you've chosen to keep. If it's hours and minutes, then it's the number of minutes in a day is the amount of uniqueness that you have in that column. So just by splitting date and time, maybe truncating off those seconds, really reduces the amount of uh, cardinality in those columns or that the uniqueness of the values in those columns. But moreover, removing unnecessary rows is a huge win for calendars. Because we use that date table, that all-important date table that if we're trying to do any time intelligence needs to be contiguous across our entire time span, we need to have a row per day in our date table, our, our calendar table. And if we extend that out 100 years into the future, it seems like a good idea because we don't have to remember to add the next year on for a long time anyway. However, each time you execute a calculation or uh, do some sort of uh, processing against the tables that that table is related to, you're, you may be scanning a cross filter of that extra hundred years of rows against your fact table or, or whatever table you're, you're working against. So just be aware that it's not that, oh, we just have one extra row in our date table. We actually are multiplying that across the tables that, it's, that we're working with. So pare down that date table and only include dates that you really need. And this is another call out to making sure that you understand your calculations. I think I talked about these tip number seven tips a lot when I was talking about know your DAX. But you do want to be cautious with your calculations. And be aware, though, that calculated columns, if you're not having a problem in processing, they are going to be static in your data model. They're not going to affect your user performance. But that's only after the data model is completely loaded and processed. And if you're running in direct query against a database and you're creating some calculated columns, then um, you will find that those can affect your data performance in your page because the direct query will run those each time. Uh, it goes back to the data source. Measures, however, unlike calculated columns, which for any imported data set are stored just like a regular column in your in-memory column or data store, measures are calculated during each query that's executed because they respect the filter context of the page of the um, visualization and even of the row that they pertain to in the visualization. So those are going to uh, impact performance. And I talked earlier about how my experience, when I started to write this uh, blog post, really became vivid when I would create or update calculated columns or relationships. That's when I saw this inefficiency emerge the most noticeably. And it was only after I pushed this up to the Power BI service and I started to try to run it from there that I realized how seriously it was impacting my user experience as well. So what can we do about this? Well, I have two techniques I want to recommend to you, one of which I'm going to be able to demonstrate. So the first one is to check the usage of memory uh, in your data model. I showed you the file size of my solutions and how they ballooned when I added this very inefficient 
table. But that was just a thumbnail estimate of the impact of adding that table. What really makes that stand out is using something like Casper de Jong's Power Pivot Memory Usage Tool. Unfortunately, although there is a version of this for uh, SSAS, which is referenced the bullet at the bottom of the page, there is no version of this right now that will work for Power BI. So uh, today, I would like to show you the impact of some of these, implementing some of these tips by using Casper de Jong's tool on my data set and show you how it can illustrate quite clearly how much space each column is taking up in your memory. The other technique that I'd like to mention is the uh, tools that are available to check your DACs. There are um, a number of tips that pertain to making sure that your formulas are efficient and that you're uh, avoiding using full table scans if you can. Uh, DAX Studio is a tool that can help you to determine how your queries are going to execute. There's also a new version of DAX Editor available that will work with SSAS tabular models. So be aware of those tools and take advantage of those as well to streamline your DAX. So let's find out if this is any better. The way we're going to do this is I have uh, a Excel workbook here. And I am going to load some data into my Excel workbook. That is the data that I was using in my Power BI solution. So I'm going to avoid making you watch me type this over and over by putting it in the buffer. And, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Let's do it this way. Sorry about that. There we go. And I'm going to point to a database called Recording. And just like Power BI, Excel uses Power Query to load data into an in-memory data model. It is the same in-memory columnar data store, that X-Velocity engine, that Power BI uses. And that's why this is such a good uh, tool to use to see what the impact is going to be in Power BI. So I am loading data, and this looks exactly like it would look if I was loading this data in Power BI because it's the same tool. I have a number of tables available to me in the database. I'm going to pull this task table. We're going to see why in a minute. But I'm going to load the data into the data model and only into the data model. I'm not going to load it into the table. So you won't actually see the data get loaded. Oh, 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 let me just, I'm sorry. Hang on, I want to get rid of this one. I apologize. We'll use SF task 2. Um, sorry about that. I did do a dry run before this, so you'll be happy to know that I know this is going to work. But the problem was I didn't completely delete my query from the solution. So that's gone. So you can see here, it has now read 382,000 rows. But down at the bottom, it's still retrieving the data. It's taking that data, it's processing it, and it's loading it into that X-Velocity data store. And it takes some time to do this. It takes a little while. And this is part of that delay that we experience when we're loading up a data set that's inefficient. So when this is done, this will clear, and we will be ready to work with our data set. We can actually take a look at what's in there. There we go. So that's how long it took to load the pure table. And if I point a, if I run the macro, get memory usage, which I have loaded into Excel 
from the Casper de Jong site that has the Power Pivot uh, memory usage tool. If I run that query, I can actually load a pivot table with information about what is stored in memory in the data model here at Excel, which is the same as what would be stored in Power BI. This visualization here on the right, there's two pivot tables exposed here. The one on the right shows us the size of the overall table in memory. It's 1.2 gig. So it's pretty big for one data table. And if I expand it, I can see the detail oh, sorry, of all of the columns and how much memory each of them is taking up. Note that the description column is taking up almost a gig worth of memory in my in memory data store. This visualization over here on the left shows us for this table, which right now we're only going to have one table in this demo, but you could load up your whole data model and look at the whole thing. Each column is listed, as is the data type of the column. So let's just sort this by largest to smallest memory size. We're going to get the columns in the same order that they're in in the right-hand visualization, but we're going to see something interesting, which is that we can see the database types. And look at all of our top columns. They're all the string columns. It isn't until we get all the way down to the 40, 40th row that we find this 40 meg column that has a probably 40k column, excuse me, column that is a uh, eight byte integer. So that is a pretty clear illustration that our strings are more unique, that they are taking up more memory storage, and also perhaps they're useful or not useful to our planned reporting. So let's take a look at that. Let's think about this description field. This description field is a hand-typed data item that is unique for every user. Um, first thing I do when I get to know data is I start to dig in on some of the columns and I find out that, that this, this is a very large table um, and, uh, excuse me, this is a very large field and taking a look across the column, what I found was that frequently it was filled with sentences after sentence of content very difficult to use in a Power BI style aggregated visualization. It's possible we might want that in a detail report about a small group of tasks, but the truth is that it's not going to add to our capability to deliver information to our users in Power BI. So my recommendation for that column would be that we probably just don't need it, and it certainly isn't worth one gig worth of space in our memory. Let's go down and take a look at the first six, because that's where we get down to about 10 meg of size, and then there's a big jump down after that. The next biggest column is Synity Call Recording, 186 meg. This is a custom column. Again, I've done some data discovery. I've gotten to know my data because that's what, uh, that's what we do when we're prepping our data for building a Power BI data model. And I know that anything that ends in underscore underscore C is a custom column. And if I look at that, it's, it's part of a call recording system. And I don't think that there's any value in adding a call recording system data element, especially in this case, it's the content of the call recording, to my Power BI reports. ID is another good size column. Now, I say good size because it's, we've jumped all the way down to 25 meg here, but that's still pretty big. It's highly unique column. It is, if we look over on the left, it is another string column, and it's 25 meg. 
So we've, we've found that you know, our top three columns are of significant size. So what can we do about that easily? Well, one thing we can do is just see what the, dis the changes would be if we remove those large string columns. And in fact, here I'm calling out, and let me just make that a little bit bigger, a couple of the columns. I've commented out the subject column, the description column, and if I scroll down a little bit more, you can see I've pulled out that Cinity call recording custom column as well. So ignoring for the moment the uh, highly unique ID column, which we know is, is different for every single row, let's pay attention to these, uh, these other three columns. If we take this query, come in here, we go ahead and delete this existing query, and let's go ahead and just delete this page, and let's do the exercise again. We're going to grab that same query that has, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to do. I'm going to make you watch me type that again. Sorry about that. I wanted to do this and paste in our query. And this is the same query, but we're going to pull out those big string fields, the top three string fields ignoring ID for the moment. Let's go ahead and run our query and see if it performs a little bit differently. We're going to load to data model only. And first of all, our query is proceeding. And it's done pretty fast. And now down at the bottom, we're watching the data load. I can't zoom in because it freezes the image. But you can see that that went much faster than the initial data load. So already we're finding that data load is speeded up considerably. But let's see if we run the macro what our performance is like. Wow. We're down to 100 meg just by getting rid of description that Cinity call recording field and the subject field, which was another highly unique string value. So we can take a look at our list. And now, by far, our ID field is our most uh, memory intensive field. We've got the Cinity recording field. And let's just take a look what's its data type. We'll just sort this over here so we can see it's another one of those big strings. Take, take a look at the field, decide whether or not we need it, and remove it if possible. But the next one is create a date. So let's take a look at what we're going to do in our next query. So we're going to go through, and I've just, I'm not going to drag you through the process of finding all of these fields that have a lot of descriptive text in them. Let's do find that Cinity recording, though. You can see that this one's been removed. And I also, I basically removed all of the Cinity uh, columns. Again, getting rid of anything I'm not going to report on. There's no reason to carry it around if I'm not going to use it. But I've also removed a number of other fields, including making some modifications to our dates. So our dates were um, in a date time format, and I'm converting them to a date format so that they are smaller. And in doing so, I'm truncating off the time. So the, um, each of the dates that I kept, I made this modification to as well. So you can see that I'm letting the database do the heavy lifting on this. So let's grab this. Get rid of this query that we've got here so we don't have query confusion. We'll delete this page. And we will once more pull from our database ah, sorry. And 
paste in query. Now let's see what the performance differences are this time. I'm going to create a connection, add to the data model. Now it's done with the query already. Down at the bottom of the screen, we can see that it's done retrieving the data and processing it. The data is loaded much faster. And if we come over here and run the macro, now our entire query size is about 55 meg. Still wrestling with that ID field. Created date is still pretty big. But now look at what fields are our next biggest fields. All IDs. Many, many IDs come in at a, at, uh, as a large fields now. They were always that big, but one meg before was comparatively a uh, very small size. So we can see very clearly that our ID field is our next biggest field. So in order to deal with that one, that one's a little bit different. And I'm going to cheat a bit here. And I'm going to take the row number ordered by ID and insert that as an integer ID. Now, this really, for a data model where I'm using this ID referenced from another field, I would need to make sure that this surrogate ID that I'm creating is also used back in the other source table. What's important here is that I'm taking off this unique ID field because it's not efficient in my reporting data model. What I am not doing for any of these fields, I am not removing them from our data store. I am not removing them from our data warehouse or removing them in any way from our systems. I am only keeping them out of our reporting data model. And I need to make sure that I can still reference this so my process for replacing this ID needs to ensure that references aren't destroyed from another table. But because this is the reporting data model, there is not likely to be anything lost by removing the string that was the original ID. So we're going to do this one last time and take a look at how much space this new data model takes up. So here's the query replacing the integer ID in place of the old ID field and also removing any fields that are unnecessary. How long does this take to pull? It's still pretty fast. It's not any slower than it was before. Let's see how much memory it takes up. 18 meg. So we've gone from 1.2 gig to 18 meg of memory for a table without losing any reporting detail. We still have quite a bit of information about every row in this task table. And we still have a number of highly unique columns represented, but we, are, we have streamlined the table so that we've taken out anything we're not going to use and things that we still need to keep that weren't efficient, we've made more efficient like dates, like ID columns. And we can continue this uh, eventually, there's a trade-off to be made, right? How, how much am I going to streamline this um, and how much benefit will I get out of it? So my next 
concern would be these ID columns that I've highlighted, each of which is a string, a unique GUID, like the ID column was for our task table. Each of those is representing a column in another table. So I would recommend that if this was still problematic, for one reason or another, if my data loads were taking too long, or if my reporting was uh, taking too long, or if it was just too big a data model, I should continue to streamline those columns by making those surrogate keys using ID fields as well. That's my next big win here. And evaluating whether I actually need all of these columns. Status is probably a fantastic column to use for reporting. Priority is probably very important and worth the value. But some of these others, um, outcome C, I don't know what the content is. I'm not sure. I need to do some research to find that out. So there's some judgment calls to be made, but it is important to make those judgment calls and not just default to the poor performance because that's how your table initially loaded. You have tools and you can make modifications to your data set. So in co conclusion, uh, I want to emphasize that I am not saying that Power BI is not fast. Power BI is fast, and it will perform. And it is very capable, performant data model. And I have given you a brief explanation of the in-memory column in your data store, but it's highly efficient, very capable of handling uh, many different kinds of data at, at quite impressive speeds. But large is a relative concept depending on the efficiency of the data in your model. I have loaded 173 plus million rows of data into my Power BI data model and used it. But they were very, very narrow columns filled with integers and it worked very well. But a, a table like this one, which by the way was a Salesforce task table with some custom columns created by various other tools, are, can have data in them that are not as performant and not as um, highly tuned. And so it's important to think about your data model, what kind of calculations you're executing on that data model, and how to make it perform best for your users. The, uh, Information in this presentation uh, was information that I learned by reading presentations and blog posts and articles by a lot of other people. I've tried to provide you with links to everything that I have learned and referenced. And these are some other excellent references for learning about using Power BI and making your data models work better. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, and if there uh, are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or try. Yeah, sure, there are a few. Uh, does the slicer issue apply to Power BI visual slicers also? Yes, yes. So that's absolutely true. Um, and the you know, the message is not don't use slicers, it is use them with an understanding that it's another visual on the screen and it can, it's going to cause some evaluation of whether or not each value needs to be visible on the screen and therefore some calculation and some processing time as you change your selections within the slicers and they impact each other. If you turn off cross filtering, and each slicer just remains stable and is not impacted by the other, um, assuming they're, you've got a star schema and they are uh, out on the, uh, you know, out on the points, then in that case, they may not impact each other's performance as much. So that's another tool you can use. I have a large Power BI model in which I am un unavoidably using text columns as a relation as relationship columns. How would I change to using integer surrogate keys? Could I hash the strings or something like that? Uh, yes, it depends on how you're using those columns. So if you don't need the content of those, all you need is the fact that they're unique references to each other, 
then you can use, you can look up, you know, creating a surrogate key in Google, just Google that, um, and find out, or use your favorite uh, search engine, I guess I should say, and, and, and find uh, ways to replace those strings with, I would recommend, you know, the smallest integer that works and will work for your expected growth. <clears throat> um, if you're using the content of those for one reason or another, you might think of a way to just make them shorter, smaller, um, and because they're unique IDs, though, the cardinality is not something you can really reduce, as, as I would often recommend with string columns. Okay. Uh, does the calendar auto calculated column function minimize the size of the calendar table? Calendar auto calculated function. I don't think that it will minimize the size of the table, uh, but I'm going to look that up and see, and I will add that to the set of questions that was, that's on the blog article that's up there now on my site. Okay. Um, you might have to do this at another time. I know people are requesting to, sh to show how the slicers work. Oh. So. Okay. <laughs> um, I can do a quick little demo. I have a set of tables in the same database that I can pull in. And I'm not sure that this is exactly what is being asked, but what I just pulled in was three tables, one called color, one called item, and one called date. This is kind of my little test data set and uh, got a couple of test columns in there, but basically color can join item on color ID. Each item has a color ID, a start and end date, a couple of other attributes. My ID, you can see in my date table that I've used a date surrogate key. Um, I can join from date to item on that. If I wanted to do time intelligence on this date table, I would have to join on a date field, by the way. But I don't, so I'm going to just join on the date ID. And when I do, I can now place this graphic of a slicer on the screen and drop in color. And now I have a list of colors. To populate that list, Power BI had to go uh, query the column or data store, pull out all the values, and put them into the slicer. And then it had to check and see which one is selected, in this case none, and populate the right row. So that's where you get the multiple, multiple queries. But let's just create a little graph very quickly of the uh, colors along the axis and the number of items. And lo and behold, I have one item of each of four different colors. But if I click now on the slicer for green, when I clicked on that, it checked to see which one did she click. Oh, she selected color ID number whatever, two. And go back to the item table and query that and pull out the number of green values and put that on the screen. So you can see there's interaction taking place, which was what makes this so popular. I, excuse me, so powerful and popular. But also, it's interaction. So if I had on the screen 12 different slicers, let's say I put in another one that was dates-based, now they're interacting across each other. So you remember I had a star schema. Color was attached to items, was attached to dates. And as I click, if I pick uh, red, color affects the item, but also affects the date. And this is where you start getting the compounding of the cross filters between the slicers. If I had millions of rows here and, you know, half a dozen or, you know, a dozen slicers on the page. It would be uh, maybe a highly effective page for the user, but probably the performance would impact the user experience. Okay. 
Well, I think we are about out of time. Um, so I know there are a couple questions that we didn't get answered, so I will make sure to get those to Rachel. Um, she always, you usually do share your slides, correct, Rachel? I do. Yeah. I do. And in fact, this presentation has already been uh, shared out there. Um, unfortunately, my slide that I'm showing, oh, sorry, my slide that I'm showing on the screen right now is, well, well I was showing the screen, right? Uh, doesn't have my uh, blog URL in it, so let me go back here. This one does. So it's, it's rachelmartino.com. Jeff, spell Rachel right. Sorry about that. And um, there is a, there are actually two blog entries there, one for the original posting, which is linked because it was on the Pragmatic Works site, and another one for the questions that had been asked as I've done this presentation in the last few months. And I will add to that questions one, any questions that didn't get answered today. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. As always, the session was recorded, and you'll receive an email tomorrow with the link to the recording. Um, I hope everyone has a safe and happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you guys next week, hopefully. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Liz. You have a happy Thanksgiving, too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.